I'd like to welcome everyone to this second podcast of The Catholic Thing. I'm uh, Robert Royal. I'm the editor-in-chief of The Catholic Thing, which I think most of you know is a daily column series that appears online 365 days a year. And we're starting this special series of podcasts because, as many of you know, the, um, the Holy See has gathered together a group of people in a synod on synodality here in Rome. So today is October 7. It's a Saturday. We've just been through about three days of a mass and then some sessions and some question and answer sessions with um, uh, the press corps. So I'm happy to be joined by my uh, longtime friend and colleague, Father Gerald Murray, who you've probably also seen with me on the EWTN Papal Posse, and another long friend who I initially got to know in more academic circles, but has turned into be, be a very probing voice uh, of journalism here in Rome. That's Diane Montagna. Diane, we're very happy to have you with us today. So, um, here we all are. Like the Brady Bunch. Uh, Diane, let me ask you, because you've been putting some very probing questions to the um, press spokesman here in Rome, and particularly, particularly yesterday, you ask them about the Holy Spirit. Can you tell us a little bit about what you wanted to do with that uh, that question? Well, I think that yesterday's question um, was really a question that many people have had throughout this whole process. There's been a lot of talk, and this was the question that I put to Paolo Ruffini, who, you know, Paolo Ruffini is a very nice man. He's the prefect for the Vatican Secretariat for Communications, um, a good man, probably in a difficult position now. But I had asked him, um, synod officials, including himself, uh, have repeatedly told us that the, the Holy Spirit is the protagonist of the synod. That's the word that, that's used, the protagonist. Um, and the Holy Spirit is invoked over and over again. So he simply said to, to Paolo Ruffini, um, the church traditionally, and not only traditionally, determines whether something is of the Holy Spirit um, in three ways. Uh, by, uh, by looking at if it's in conformity with divine revelation, with the unanimous consensus of the church fathers, and with apostolic tradition. And so I put to him the question, uh, how is this assembly determining whether something comes from the Holy Spirit or from another spirit? And what kind of response did you get uh, to, to that question? Yeah, well, I'll try to stay as close to what Paolo Ruffini actually said. He said, um, I, can recite, um, I can recite the creed, which you know well, he said. Uh, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and he said that historically, uh, in, in, in prior history, as in present history, sometimes there are meetings where the people of God uh, come together, they meet, they pray, God is with them, and the Holy Spirit helps them to discern. Now, what people wouldn't see if they watched the video, although I posted this on Twitter, is that um, on day one of the press briefings, we had, a, we had got to hold on to the microphone, which normally uh, in the past has not been allowed. You ask one question and then the microphone is quickly taken away. Well, after my first question, they quickly took the microphone away because the previous day I had asked them follow-ups. <laughs> And, this is um, why we love you, <laughs> Diane, because yeah. <laughs> you keep probing and you don't you don't let them set the, the framework. So, exactly. I mean, in other words, they didn't. They, obviously, Paolo Ruffini is a is a kind of a press spokesman, a PR yeah. person, and so he can't give you much more of a theological um, answer than that. Let's well, bring in Father. Mar to. He should be able to actually. Well, yeah, he should be prepared for that because they they are using the term Holy Spirit in all yes. Bring in Father Murray. Father, you know, you and I have talked about this on EWTN and, you know, in other uh, forums, because it seems like um, the Holy Spirit is, in, at least over some s certain subjects like governance and apparently LGBT and perhaps even divorced and remarried Catholics, that the Holy Spirit seems to be revising what the Father and the Son um, have said in the scriptures. And so... Has God changed his mind, or it's just, just a confusion here about what the Holy Spirit could be saying at this point in a large group like a synod? Well, um, there's a lot of confusion here. Let's start with this notion that the Holy Spirit is the protagonist. The protagonist means someone who causes and sets something in motion and, and continues uh, to inspire what's happening. Um, the protagonist for this synod is Pope Francis, who called it. 
Uh, we all pray to the Holy Spirit that he will guide Pope Francis and all of us. But to attribute the synod as being the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in a way that the church never has said about synods, synods are the work of the pastors of the church who seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but there's no guarantee that either the individual member's statements or any kind of joint statement will be the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, why are we saying this? Well, because there's a certain sense I get here, which is that to justify what may come out of the synod, they want to sort of say, well, you can't object to the final product because the Holy Spirit is the protagonist. And as Diane was saying, how do we judge what spirit is behind it? So I think there's a claim here at the beginning which has nothing to do with the way the Catholic Church conducts these kind of meetings, and that is that the Holy Spirit is speaking through the meeting in a way that the Church has never said uh, happens in the life of, of these type of events. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a claim. It's almost like we're the voice of God all of a sudden, uh, and even if that seems to contradict or they keep using the term sort of developing um, what, the Holy, what the Holy Spirit has revealed in the past. Diane, I'd like to turn more generally. I mean, you have been around in Rome. Uh, Father and I, I think, have been to every single synod since this pope was elected. In fact, we were, we were first on EWTN, I think, together um, when he was uh, elected in the previous conclave. But you're around all the time. You're here year round. How do you feel about the, the media atmosphere? Because certainly the Holy See has also been trying to manage pretty severely what kind of information is going to be released. The Holy Father even has kind of suggested that journalists like us are gossiping by talking about what's going on in the Senate. What's your feeling? How much does this resemble or how much is it different from what's normal uh, in Rome? Uh, well, I think that they're generally speaking, there's a lot of discontent among the journalists. We've only had two bre press briefings so far. Today, there will be another. But on the first day, uh, one of the Italian journalists, um, from the beginning, in, uh, soon into the, the press briefing, she said, um, she commented on the silence and the lack of information that we're giving. And she said, she said this, is a, this is a rigid si uh, system that is being imposed here. Uh, I got rigid, a rigid system uh, um, that's being imposed. Um, and other journalists have contacted me uh, after yesterday's press briefing saying that they're not even attending because we're not being given any information. It's not really worth it. They'll watch via live stream. Um, so I think generally there's an atmosphere of discontent. And of course, well, you've been at least one of at least one of these press briefings. What, has that been your sense too? My sense. I thought I thought it was highly ma stage managed. I was there. Diane was. This is the day she asked her a couple of follow up questions. Um, no, I see. There's an an attempt to try and create the impression that uh, the whole synod process involves everybody, including the members of the press, in this sort of common mission to listen to the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the, the Pope even said the press should be on kind of a fast and not get involved in reporting. One of the reporters made a joke about that. Uh, I think there's a misconception here that the press is, a, is being used as an arm of the synodal management to convey what the synod itself is telling us is happening. That's not the job of the press. The press should be an independent source of... Uh, information for the viewers and the readers, but also as a challenge to any attempt to manage it. I, 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 the, I, I don't know if Diane would agree with me, but that's the sense I got. I, I do agree. Uh, and I think that um, if we look at, say, Cardinal Zen's recent letter to the bishops and the cardinals who are participating in the, in the synod, um, he was warning them about what he said was um, manipulation through the procedures that are being imposed. And I think whether you look at the silence that is being imposed upon the participants, the members of the Synod, not only during the Synod, but also after the Synod, they've been told they're not allowed to say anything about their intervention or another, um, and some of the other rules. And also this, this attitude towards the journalists, it seems as though there is an attempt to shut down any opposition to the work, what they would call the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I'd like to, I mean, one of my uh, perceptions of what's been going on so far, and I'd be curious about the reaction of both of you to this, is that 
they seem to they seem more sensitive um, than in the past, and maybe they've learned in the past that they've gotten burned by some um, some members of, of the media. But you know, we're in the business to, um, as Father said, to try to get out information to people. And this papacy has been very strong in claiming that they want to have a total transparency and they want to have everyone involved. And I think that that has to be a part of it. If what we're going to be doing is, is covering, commenting on what's going on. But I get the sense that they they feel vulnerable in some way. And it may have something to do with the weakness of some of the you know, deve- so-called developments that they're trying to put forward. That It's pretty hard to just to take one issue to, to justify blessing same-sex civil unions um, as if it's a matter of an extension of pastoral practice or charity or something, when there's been such a, a constant teaching against uh, homosexuality, not only in the Catholic tradition, but going all the way back to the Law of Moses. So I, I, I detect a kind of fragility that maybe wasn't as much in the past um, synods, at least the parts of it that I've attended. I'm curious, I mean, Diane, what's your, does that sound, does that sound right to you, or, or I don't know? It does, it does sound right, Bob, and um, I point to two things. One is that um, they're not, generally during a synod, we would have daily press conferences where different uh, prelates would come, different uh, probably experts that could that could be part of the synod, though not with the boat. There would be a press conference each day, and that was an opportunity for journalists to uh, to ask tough questions, and that's how things got out into the media. That has been shut down the, during the synod, so we're having daily press briefings with Paolo, Paolo Ruffini, but there was in fact supposed to be a press conference today, but then that didn't didn't materialize. Uh, but I'd like to point to one. There's one member of the of the synod who she was she was a Swiss she's a Swiss lay one woman Helena Jessepin Spieler is her name and she was chosen to be on the panel during the presentation of the instrumental laboris. Uh it was either shortly before that uh, before that panel or right after she said and I can quote I am for women's ordination the LGBTQI plus issue has to be taken seriously and quote this is our last chance. So I think actually, whether it's if you're dealing with the the issue of governance in the church and separating governance from holy orders or the women's diaconate, ultimately they want the priesthood. We've seen seeds of this throughout the past synods. And I do think also perhaps because Pope Francis is getting older, he may not be in good health. This really is, or they might see this as their last chance to to uh, accomplish what they would like to accomplish. Father, what do you think? I mean, there's a sense of, I think, a sense of vulnerability, and I think Diana is quite right. There's, there's also this sense of urgency. Yes, I agree with the sense of vulnerability. On Thursday, Paolo Ruffini was asked, you know, what's the reason why people can't uh, even speak about their own interventions at the Synod? And he said this very strange thing. He said, the synod is a body, and it speaks as a body, and a body only has one voice. Um, This is not the way the church conducts its affairs. Uh, A synod is a composition of many bodies, many people with different voices, and they're meant to be heard. And then the result is not supposed to be a unanimity in the sense of absolute uh, exclusion of the possibility of disagreeing with final results. That's why we have votes at the end of a synod on propositions. So what I think here is you're vulnerable, you feel vulnerable if you know that your goal is completely unrealizable in the ordinary course of events. Nobody's ever going to all agree on everything coming out of a meeting like this over the course of a month. Unless, of course, you forbid them to talk about it so that when the final document comes out, nobody except the people in charge can tell you what happened. So I noticed that they changed and said they're not or they they announced that they're not going to punish people who violate the rule that you can't talk even about your own uh, intervention. So I think we're going to be hearing some things from the floor. And what Diane says is very true. How can you pretend that there's going to be one body speaking with one voice? When you have people who, who reject Catholic teaching sitting next to someone who affirms it, uh, mm-hmm. you're obviously in conflict. The pretension that conflict in and of itself is bad and, and it's a sign that the Holy Spirit's not there. No, it's just the opposite. 
when there's conflict to defend the truth, that's a sign the Holy Spirit's there defending the truth. So I hope we... Yeah, and we don't even have to be talking about conflict. We, we can be talking about different points of view because not, Catholics yes. don't have to be uh, at one about every single opinion. They have to be at one about the faith. Well, listen, I'm, I, we, we have to stop here because our charism at the Catholic thing is brevity, as I always say, brevity in writing and brevity in speaking. But that just means that I'll have the opportunity to bring you both back uh, very soon. This We're coming, today is Saturday, and of course we're coming to the first full week next week of the Synod. And I think we'll begin to see better some of these lines that we're only starting to get hints of at this point. Uh, but we'll probably emerge more fully. So thank you both for being here, and we'll have you both back very soon. And, and thank you all for watching. Uh, come back and, and, and see this, which we're trying to, um, I, I think, provide a different channel in a way because so much is being claimed by people hysterically progressive or hysterically conservative. What we're trying to give you is a steady voice here. That's how, actually what we're calling this Vatican thing, which is our coverage, a steady voice. And so we will do our absolute best to be both accurate in what we report to you and both temperate in how we reflect on what's actually happening. So it's been good to have you here, and we'll all be reconvening again before long. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>